This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in April 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 26. Well, when they was all gone, the king, he asked Mary Jane how they was off for spare rooms, and she said she had one spare room which would do for Uncle William, and she'd give her own room to Uncle Harvey, which was a little bigger, and she would turn into the room with her sisters and sleep on a cot, and up garret was a little cubby with a pallet in it. The king said the cubby would do for his valley, meaning me. So Mary Jane took us up, and she showed them their rooms, which was plain but nice, she said she'd have her frocks and a lot of other traps took out of her room if they was in Uncle Harvey's way, but he said they weren't. The frocks was hung along the wall, and before them was a curtain made out of calico that hung down to the floor. There was an old hair trunk in one corner, and a guitar box in another, and all sorts of little knick-knacks and jim cracks around, like girls brisking up a room with. The king said it was all the more homely and more pleasanter for these fixins, and so don't disturb them. The duke's room was pretty small, but plenty good enough, and so was my cubby. That night they had a big supper, and all them men and women was there, and I stood behind the king in the duke's chairs and waited on them, and the niggers waited on the rest. Mary Jane, she sat at the head of the table, with Susan alongside her, and said how bad the biscuits was, and how mean the preserves was, and how ornery and tough the fried chickens was and all that kind of rot, the way women always do for to force out compliments, and the people all knowed everything was tip-top and said so, said, How do you get the biscuits to brown so nice? And, Where for the land's sake did you get these amazing pickles? And all that kind of humbug talky-talk, just the way people always does at a supper, you know. And when it was all done, me and the hare lip had supper in the kitchen off of the leavings, whilst the others was helping the niggers clean up the things. The hair lip, she got to pumping me about England, and blessed if I didn't think the ice was getting mighty thin sometimes. She says, Did you ever see the king? Who, William Fourth? Well, I bet I have. He goes to our church. I knowed he was dead years ago, but I never let on. So when I says he goes to our church, she says, What, regular? "'Yes, regular. His pew's right over opposite iron, on the other side of the pulpit. "'I thought he lived in London. "'Well, he does. Where would he live? "'But I thought you lived in Sheffield. "'I see I was up a stump. "'I had to let on to get choked with a chicken bone "'so as to get time to think how to get down again. "'Then I says, "'I mean he goes to our church regular when he's in Sheffield.' That's only in the summer time when he comes there to take the sea baths. Why, how you talk! Sheffield ain't on the sea. Well, who said it was? Why, you did. I didn't another. You did. I didn't. You did. I never said nothing of the kind. Well, what did you say then? Said he come to take the sea baths. That's what I said. Well, then how's he going to take the sea baths if it ain't on the sea? Looky here, I says. Did you ever see any Congress water? Yes. Well, did you have to go to Congress to get it? Why, no. Well, neither does William Fourth have to go to the sea to get a sea bath. How does he get it, then? Gets it the way people down here gets Congress water, in barrels. There in the palace at Sheffield, they've got furnaces, and he wants his water hot. They can't bile that amount of water away off there at the sea. They haven't got no conveniences for it. Oh, I see now. You might have said that in the first place and saved time. When she said that, I see I was out of the woods again, and so I was comfortable and glad. Next, she says, Do you go to church, too? Yes, regular. Where do you sit? Why, in our pew. Whose pew? Why, ourn, your Uncle Harvey's. Hisn't. What does he want with a pew? Wants it to sit in. What do you reckon he want him with it? Why, I thought he'd be in the pulpit. 
Rot him, I forgot he was a preacher. I see he was up a stump again. So I played another chicken bone and got another think. Then I says, Blame it, do you suppose there ain't but one preacher to a church? Why, what do they want with more? What, to preach before a king? I never did see such a girl as you. They don't have no less than seventeen. Seventeen? My land! Why, I wouldn't set out such a string as that. Not if I never got to glory. It must take em a week. Shucks, they don't all of em preach the same day. Only one of em. Well, then, what does the rest of em do? Oh, nothing much. Loll around, pass the plate, and one thing or another. But mainly they don't do nothing. Well, then, what are they for? Why, they're for style. Don't you know nothing? Well, I don't want to know no such foolishness as that. How are servants treated in England? Do they treat em better and we treat our niggers? No, a servant ain't nobody there. They treat em worse than dogs. Don't they give em holidays the way we do? Christmas and New Year's week and Fourth of July? Oh, just listen. A body could tell you hain't ever been to England by that. Why, Harold, why, Joanna, they never see a holiday from year's end to year's end. Never go to the circus nor theater, nor nigger shows, nor nowheres. Nor church? Nor church. But you always went to church. Well, I was gone up again. I forgot I was the old man's servant. The next minute I whirled in on a kind of an explanation how a valley was different from a common servant, and had to go to church whether he wanted to or not, and set with the family, on account of its being the law. But I didn't do it pretty good, and when I got done, I see she warn't satisfied. She says, Honest Injun now, hain't you been telling me a lot of lies? Honest Injun, says I, none of it at all? None of it at all, not a lie in it, says I. Lay your hand on this book and say it. I see it warn't nothing but a dictionary, so I laid my hand on it and said it. So then she looked a little better satisfied and says, Well then, I'll believe some of it, but I hope to be gracious if I'll believe the rest. What is it you won't believe, Joe? says Mary Jane, stepping in with Susan behind her. It ain't right nor kind for you to talk so to him, and him a stranger and so far from his people. How would you like to be treated so? That's always your way, Mame, always sailing in to help somebody before they're hurt. I hain't done nothing to him. He's told some stretchers, I reckon, and I said I wouldn't swallow it all, and that's every bit and grain I did say. I reckon he can stand a little thing like that, can he? I don't care whether twas little or whether twas big. He's here in our house, and a stranger, and it wasn't good of you to say it. If you was in his place, it would make you feel ashamed, and so you oughtn't to say a thing to another person that will make them feel ashamed. What, Mame, he said, it don't make no difference what he said, that ain't the thing. The thing is for you to treat him kind, and not be saying things to make him remember he ain't in his own country, and amongst his own folks. I says to myself, this is a girl that I'm letting that old reptile rob her of her money. Then Susan, she waltzed in, and if you'll believe me, she did give Harelip hark from the tomb. Says I to myself, and this is another one that I'm letting him rob her of her money. Then Mary Jane, she took another inning, and went in sweet and lovely again, which was her way. But when she got done, there weren't hardly anything left of poor Harelip. So she hollered. All right, then, says the other girls. You just ask his pardon. She done it, too, and she done it beautiful. She done it so beautiful it was good to hear, and I wished I could tell her a thousand lies so she could do it again. I says to myself, This is another one that I'm letting him rob her of her money. And when she got through, they all just laid theirselves to make me feel at home, I know I was amongst friends. I felt so ornery and low down and mean that I says to myself, My mind's made up. I'll hive that money for them or bust. So then I lit out. For bed, I said, meaning some time or another. When I got by myself, I went to thinking the thing over. I says to myself, 
Shall I go to that doctor private and blow on these frogs? No, that won't do. He might tell who told him. Then the king and the duke would make it warm for me. Shall I go private and tell Mary Jane? No, I dasn't do it. Her face would give them a hint, sure. They've got the money, and they'd slide right out and get away with it. If she was to fetch in and help, I'd get mixed up in the business before it was done with, I judge. No, there ain't no good way but one. I got to steal that money somehow, and I got to steal it some way that they won't suspicion that I done it. They've got a good thing here, and they ain't a-goin' to leave till they've played this family and this town for all they're worth. So I'll find a chance time enough. I'll steal it and hide it, and by and by, when I'm away down the river, I'll write a letter and tell Mary Jane where it's hid. But I'd better hive it tonight if I can, because the doctor maybe hasn't lit up as much as he lets on he has. He might scare them out of here yet. So, thinks I, I'll go and search them rooms. Upstairs the hall was dark, but I found the duke's room and started to paw around it with my hands, but I recollected it wouldn't be much like the king to let anybody else take care of that money but his own self. So then I went to his room and begun to paw around there. But I see I couldn't do nothing without a candle, and I dasn't light one, of course. So I judged I've got to do the other thing, lay for them an eavesdrop. About that time I hears their footsteps coming, and was going to skip under the bed. I reached for it, but it wasn't where I thought it would be. But I touched the curtain that hid Mary Jane's frocks, so I jumped in behind that and snuggled in amongst the gowns and stood there perfectly still. They come in and shut the door, and the first thing the Duke done was to get down and look under the bed. Then I was glad I hadn't found the bed when I wanted it. And yet, you know, it's kind of natural to hide under the bed when you are up to anything private. They sits down then, and the king says, Well, what is it? and cut it middlin' short, because it's better for us to be down there a whoopin' up the mornin' than up here giving them a chance to talk us over. Well, this is it, Capit. I ain't easy. I ain't comfortable. That doctor lays on my mind. I wanted to know your plans. I've got a notion, and I think it's a sound one. What is it, Duke? That we better glide out of this before three in the mornin', and clip it down the river with what we've got, especially seeing we got it so easy, given back to us, flung at our heads, as you may say, when, of course, we allowed to have to steal it back. I'm for knocking off and lighting out. That made me feel pretty bad. About an hour or two ago it would have been a little different, but now it made me feel bad and disappointed. The king rips out and says, What? And that sell out the rest of the property? March off like a passel of fools and leave eight or nine thousand dollars worth of property laying around, just suffering to be scooped in? And all good saleable stuff, too? The Duke, he grumbled, said the bag of gold was enough, and he didn't want to go no deeper. Didn't want to rob a lot of orphans of everything they had. Why, how you talk, says the king. We shan't rob them of nothing at all but just this money. The people that buys the property is the sufferers, because as soon as it's found out that we didn't own it, which won't be long after we've slid, the sale won't be valid, and it'll all go back to the estate. These your orphans will get their house back again, and that's enough for them. They're young and spry, and can easily earn a living. They ain't no going to suffer. Why, just think, there's thousands and thousands that ain't nigh so well off. Bless you, they ain't got nothing to complain of. Well, the king, he talked him blind, so at last he give in, and said all right, but said he believed it was blamed foolishness to stay, and that doctor hanging over them. But the king says, Cuss the doctor! What do we care for him? Ain't we got all the fools in town on our side? And ain't that a big enough majority in any town? So they got ready to go downstairs again. The duke says, I don't think we put that money in a good place. That cheered me up. I'd begun to think I weren't going to get a hint of no kind to help me. The king says, Why? Because Mary Jane'll be in mourning from this out, 
"'and first you know, the nigger that does up the rooms "'will get an order to box these duds up and put em away. "'And do you reckon a nigger can run across money "'and not borrow some of it?' "'Your head's level again, Duke,' says the king, "'and he comes a-fumblin' under the curtain two or three foot from where I was. "'I stuck tight to the wall and kept mighty still, though quivery, "'and I wondered what them fellers would say if they catched me, "'and I tried to think what I'd better do if they did catch me. "'But the king, he got the bag before I could think more than about a half a thought, "'and he never suspicioned I was around. "'They took and shoved the bag through a rip in the straw tick that was under the feather bed, "'and crammed it in a foot or two amongst the straw, "'and said it was all right now, because a nigger only makes up the feather bed, "'and don't turn over the straw tick only about twice a year, "'and so it warn't no danger of getting stole now.' "'But I knowed better. "'I had it out of there before they was halfway downstairs. "'I groped along up to my cubby "'and hid it there till I could get a chance to do better. "'I judged I'd better hide it outside of the house somewheres, "'cause if they missed it, "'they would give the house a good ransacking. "'I knowed that very well. "'Then I turned in with my clothes all on, "'but I couldn't have gone to sleep if I'd wanted to. "'I was in such a sweat to get through with the business.' By and by, I heard the king and the duke come up, so I rolled off my pallet and laid with my chin at the top of my ladder and waited to see if anything was going to happen, but nothing did. So I held on till all the late sounds had quit and the early ones hadn't begun yet, and then I slipped down the ladder. End of chapter 26